straight up. And um, it warms my heart that there's so many people here. This is the biggest one we've had in the few months that we've been going. Um, and the other thing that's pretty awesome is we have now picked over 500 members of this uh, this man. So we all started in February, and it's just like a bit of a like fun little side project really, just out of recognition of the fact there wasn't much of a community in Auckland for product managers. Um, and also it's hard for product managers, there's no real rule book for it, it's different every organisation, so a lot of people are like, ah, we're doing a good enough job. And um, this is the kind of forum that you realise that um, what you, pr you probably are doing well enough, because there's no one, one truth or one answer. Um, so thanks heaps to, to Anthony for um, stepping up and um, giving this presentation tonight, and also organising the venue um, for us, which is always a, a, a difficult part of the equation. Pretty, um, uh, obviously, testament to to you already just the turnout, but I think um, it's, it sounds like an awesome uh, topic of conversation as well. I know for me personally in the organisation that I work at, we're grappling a lot with the various roles um, in product management, so the product manager, the product owner, the BA, the project manager, and how, can they all coexist? Um, and if so, do, they, do you try and get all of them working as a team across like a breadth of products, or do you just try and get one person doing everything like quite deep and narrow? Um, so maybe we'll address some of that stuff. Hopefully, tonight, so. hopefully. Um, I'll hand it over to you, mate. All right, Good thanks, Matt. All right, so we'll just, just start off with a few housekeeping things. Uh, if the fire alarm goes, run like hell. Um, <laughs> but no, get out of the building assembly areas, the car park out on the road there. Um, bathrooms are at the top of the stairs, so if you go out of here, up the stairs, around a bit, the bathrooms are around there. And I think that's all the housekeeping that I need to do. So anyway, hello everybody. My name is Anthony Marta. I am a product owner with Orion Health. Um, I've been here about six months, and previously I was at uh, Fiserv New Zealand, which was previously known as MCOM for anybody who might know that name, uh, as a um, senior product owner there. And so, sort of with that, um, this kind of sets a bit of context of where I'm coming from for this talk. So as Matt was sort of saying, product management, product ownership, can kind of be defined by the organisation that you do it in. There's, there's very few rules. And I just wanted to say, to talk a little bit about my background because that kind of sets the context for some of the things that I'm talking about because I know a lot of you are from a diverse range of organisations, sizes and scales and product types and whatnot. And those can be a real influence to how you do product management. So uh, I was basically doing product ownership at scale at both Fiserv and here at Orion. Um, Fiserv I grew from uh, with one team through to looking across six different teams, um, all delivering um, software about every nine months. Uh, at, here at Orion um, I'm looking across a cross-organisation release train. We've got about uh, sort of six or eight teams in the area that I'm in. Is sort of three product owners who I work with who kind of work on components that then come into my solution um, and also consuming from other parts of our business as well. So it's, it's quite large scale stuff. We're building products. We're not doing uh, the areas that I've worked in. I've been working on product organization, not really a services organization. So I'm coming at this from a product development and delivery type perspective. The products I've been working with have been large and monolithic. Mm -hmm. Um, here at Orion, we, our, our monolithic product is a collection of smaller stuff, but effectively it's a large monolithic product. And we've got multiple teams working towards a single release. Um, so that just sets a bit of context as the, the, where I'm coming from for this. So, the role, the basics. So this is from scrum.org. Um, what, what is a product owner? So we represent the stakeholders in a delivery team. We establish a shared understanding of work with the team. We maintain the backlog for the team. And we're accountable for the value delivered by the team. That's great, great words. It's a role that's not really talked about very much in Agile. There's lots and lots of stuff around how a Scrum team behaves, what the Agile principles are, what a Scrum coach should do. There's not very much at all about what the heck this product owner thing is. And that was kind of one of the reasons why I wanted to do this talk is because I'm trying to start a conversation in the Auckland software industry in particular, but just generally in companies who are doing agile and lean type things around product ownership and what it really means to be a product owner. So if it is a topic that you're interested in, I'd love to talk more with you um, after the event. 
So what's a, what's a team? What's a stakeholder? I actually really just put the slide up because when I was looking for stuff, I found this key stakeholder thing, which just made me laugh. <laughs> but, but that's effectively the product owner is sitting between the team and the business, or the, the stakeholders, the holders of the gold. So a quick recap, not, uh, probably not all of you are from uh, software delivery businesses doing Scrum, so uh, just uh, quickly, what, is, what does a Scrum team mean? Um, it's the, the team is usually sort of six to 10 people. There's usually some developers, some testers, a BA, a Scrum master, um, and then this thing called the product owner kind of gluing them to the business. So that's sort of, uh, that's Scrum, lots more to learn about that. Um, there's this concept that the product owner is the single ringable neck for the team, but what does that, what does that actually really mean? Um, it's not uh, Bart Simpson getting his neck strangled, it's about velocity, it's about speed of decision making. The product owner is there who can make decisions quickly for the team on behalf of the business. What shared understanding mean? This is about trying to get the team to understand what it is that they're trying to build. Um, if you haven't looked at specification by example, you should. And vision. So to create shared understanding, we want to give a vision to the delivery team of what it is that they're trying to build. But what does this vision thing really mean and why is it so important? This, this is my biggest learning as becoming a product owner, is communicating vision to the team and how that can influence their behavior. The Agile principles are all around self-organizing teams, teams that organize themselves around solving a business problem. But it can be really, really easy as somebody coming from the product side to say, um, yeah, I know a bit about the domain, I know a bit about the technology, uh, we've got this problem, let's build this thing to solve it, off you go. That doesn't help the team because the team just moves into this mechanical mode of, oh, the product guy told me to build this, so I'm going to go away and build this. I don't know about the teams that you guys work with, but all the teams that I've worked with have been fill, filled with really, really super smart, super intelligent, super motivated people who are way, way, way smarter than me. And I want to empower them to come up with the solution, their solutions to my business problem, not for me to provide a solution for them to build. I want them to find that solution themselves. But to do that, I need to speak their language. So I'm speaking the language, I come from the business side, I'm speaking the language of the business, but I've got all these technical delivery teams who they understand the language of technology. They're speaking the language of software development, in, in my case, in this industry. So I have to be able to translate from the business into the technical teams. That's another key part of the aspect, of the element of the product owner role, is being able to do that translation from the business domain to the technical domain. Because ultimately, what we're, what we're doing is we're shifting from a world where teams are told, build this, to solve this problem, we want you to solve this problem. What is, what is vision? Um, probably if you've been around um, Scrum or Agile for a while or product management, you've probably seen the slide on the right hand side talking about what a, a minimum viable product is, how to do it. Um, but I'd, I'd, just a, a, I'd like to present just a slightly different take on this. This provides a really good example of what is the problem that the teams are trying to solve. Now, if you sort of ignore my words on the, the right there, if you're looking at this, you'd probably say, okay, so we want to build a car. So the, my vision to the team is I want a car. Hey team, go away and build me a car. But maybe that's not the problem that my users have. Maybe they just want to get from A to B. So if I communicate my vision as, hey, my users need transport, they need to get from A to B, then if they follow the bottom one where they give the guy a skateboard, hey, skateboard's not fantastic, requires a bit of effort, but that user's gonna be happy and it meets their part of the vision through to a car. But maybe actually a car isn't what they need in the final stage. You might give them a skateboard and find out that they skate to the train station, they catch the train. Maybe what they need is better trains. They don't need a car. So it's really important about thinking about how you communicate that vision to teams that they get the business problem and not a chopped up piece of solution. The other thing that I've learned is, um, so I've, I've been in the industry about 17, 18 years, um, and I'm kind of just used to challenging people. Hey, you know, I don't really believe you about that. I want to go and find out some stuff, or can you give me more information about that? I'm just kind of used to it. Never assume that your teams are going to do that, because sometimes they will just fall into this mode of, oh, well, this is what, this is what we've always done. We're just going to keep on building this stuff. Never assume empowerment. You have to 
do things in such a way that you give empowerment to your teams, that you present it in such an abstract way that they're kind of required to challenge and think. Also, particularly in the New Zealand context, um, and for companies like Orion and Fiserv, um, so we're serving primarily, um, or the area I'm in is serving primarily the US market. Fiserv was all about US customers as well. The teams are very, very distant from the product and from the market that they're building for. So they kind of need to really understand the vision behind what it is that they're building, because I've really got no idea about that market. They're living in New Zealand, they don't understand the US um, health information exchange market or if I serve the US banking market because they're quite different. The key stakeholders are often distant as well so the product owner is playing that role of bringing that information from those stakeholders a long way away in another country to the teams. Um, it can happen as well in local businesses as well particularly when you have um, you're working in a domain that might not be the same domain as your software developers. In large, particularly a thing in larger companies, um, the head office will come up with this, right, we need to build this thing, and they'll do that chopping up and that packaging up and then hand it over to the software team in another country to go and build it. So the context can be missing. So the product owner is also playing the role of pushing back on that stuff coming in to the teams to be delivered. Push back and ask questions, get to the why of what it is that you're trying to build. Product owner also manages the backlog. So what the heck is a backlog? <laughs> Not that. So the backlog is a prioritized, sized set of stuff to do, um, where hopefully each of those things are business problems. Everything has to be in the backlog. Of, uh, a few times in, with teams I've worked on, they've sort of said, okay, well, I've got the backlog, but we've got this other stuff to work on as well well, hang on, I'm accountable for the value that you guys are delivering. Um, I have no idea about what the value of this other stuff is. How is that delivering value to our business? The teams only work off one backlog that's really important. How do we get this backlog? So the business has an idea, he hands it to the product owner, who's probably a ninja, and they create the backlog. Sounds simple, right? But where does it come from? Lots and lots and lots of different places. So. Um, people often view product owners, you've got product in your name, so you come from the product side, and so therefore you, all you're concerned about is features. The product owner, because you're straddling those two domains, the technical domain and the business domain, you have to bring in everything else as well, and so you can see that market and features is, is sort of just one of the many things. You've got quality, tech debt, team happiness is important, support, delivery engineering, innovation, UX, security compliance, more things as well. So to build that backlog is consisting of all of that stuff, and you have to be able to prioritize it. Um, ways that stuff can get into the backlog, um, particularly this is more something, that techniques for getting features in there, is um, look, look up the Google Ventures design sprint, that's a really, really interesting process about how to build a backlog. Um, there was an IOBA meetup about that a little while ago. Uh, impact mapping as well, um, if you haven't read Goiko's impact mapping book, do so, it's really interesting. Um, it's a way of getting your business problem expressed in terms of the why, rather than just everybody in the organization going straight to the, hey, we normally solve this problem by doing this, actually looking at there might be other ways of solving it, more creative things. Prioritizing the backlog. So now we've got a collection of stuff, so we've got some features in there, um, we've got some tech debt in there, how the heck do we prioritize it? Um, it depends, is the answer to that question. It always depends. Uh, teams will sometimes ask me, so how did you prioritize that? Well, it just that's like the most important stuff. But there's a few basics in there, and the biggest one is probably the, the simplest rule that most people in the product industry know is bang for buck. Um, weighted shortest job first is a more technical way of explaining it, but it's what's gonna give us the highest value in the shortest amount of time. Um, this photo here is the backlog that we're working on um, for our solution at the moment that's stretched across four tables um, and still has a bunch of stuff down the bottom there. Um, so when you're dealing with that kind of volume of stuff, the, the, what makes something more important than something else can vary um, the nature, depending on the nature of the item and even just depending on the current market conditions and it will change. So your prioritization will change over time. Um, one of my favorite sort of go-tos is, um, is this is the reason why the product owner is a role and not a rule book. If it was possible to 
distill prioritization down to a set of rules for a business, then I've, I'm, I'm done, I'm gone, no money for me. Um, but the reality is in the real world, things change, conditions change, that's the reason why the product owner is a person. Sizing the backlog. An unsized backlog has got limited value because as I said, you're looking for bang for buck. So you don't know what the size of the buck is if you don't know how big things are. Um, however, detailed sizing, particularly at a roadmap kind of level, is generally a waste of time. So as a product owner, you need to help your teams to strike that balance between estimating something down to the nth degree and giving you enough information just to say, well, how should we prioritize that? Um, this is a, a photo from an affinity sizing um, uh, exercise that we went through. Um, affinity sizing is where you just basically arrange stuff in order of, okay, start off with this one, okay, this one's bigger than it, this one's smaller than it, so on and so forth. Put them into buckets and that gives you a rough idea of the sizing, which was enough for us to get going with our um, prioritization. Cone of uncertainty though comes in here. So particularly when you're forming at the early stages of the backlog before you're shipping, the cone of uncertainty is really large. You don't know very much about these items. So if you go to a developer or a person in your organization who's building something, um, they can probably not give you much more than a hand-waving idea of how big it is. But at the beginning of the cycle, that's probably okay. As we're getting down to the, the shipping um, part of the, the uh, delivery, that's when that we start to understand how big the thing really is. And so that's where that prioritization, the sizing, can change right the way through the life cycle of delivery. And the product owner needs to manage that change. You might have to reprioritize things as you go along. Communicating the backlog. Um, don't, if you're playing the role of a product owner, and to a lesser extent a product manager as well, don't underestimate the value of communicating the backlog to your business. Nature abhors a vacuum, um, particularly if you've got CEOs who like to get their fingers into things. If there's a perception that the team is not working on stuff, they'll find new stuff for the team to do and upset your perfectly crafted backlog. Walls, boards are really, really awesome for this kind of thing. Um, it can be really good to, when it, particularly if somebody's got a, a misconception about what a team's working on, go to the board, have a discussion with them. You can, you can do that immediately. People can go and look at backlogs. They can look at what's coming up. They can get a sense for what, if they're, if they're a development team, they can get a sense of what might be on the horizon. If they're a business stakeholder, they can get an idea of what might be coming up. Communicate the backlog, really, really, really important. Then we get into delivering the backlog. So, the product owner now is getting hands-on with the delivery team. Um, I'm primarily referring here to a scrum process where you're delivering in weekly iterations, so the product owner is getting involved in the breakdown and grooming of items. Um, this is where our the minimum viable product type concept comes back in. Um, one of the, the arts of product ownership is working with your teams to try and figure out how they can break stuff down into slivers of value. Um, it can be... It, Particularly people with a very technical background, they can be very tempted to go, okay, so I want to build this component, and I want to build this component, I want to build this component, and you put them all together and it does something, but on their own, those components don't do things. So a product owner has to spend a lot of time with the teams trying to work out how to get that vertical slice. That's probably the hardest part of working directly with a team, is figuring out that vertical slice, because you're, again, you're straddling the business and the technical side. The technical folks have probably got really, really good reasons why they want to build that component first, but can I persuade them to maybe carve off a little bit of it, a little bit of the other one, a little bit of the other one, and give me some value in a shorter period of time? At this point, the product, this is probably where the most pressure is coming on the product owner to answer questions. So in a grooming session, grooming sessions can be really, really intense because somebody in the team will say, but what about, and I'll go, ah, I didn't think of that. So. As a product owner, you have to try and strike a balance between rightness and speeds, because if you want the teams to work on this thing, you're going to have to give them an answer to that question. But if you have to go away and get an answer to that question, it's going to take time, they can't work on that thing. How important is that thing? Uh, make a guess. Maybe you can make a guess. You, you, know, you know some of the domain already. Um, so I work off the 80-20 the rule. If I'm right about 80% of the time, I'm wrong 20% of the time, I'm happy. In practice, it's actually more like 50-50. If, if I get my calls fi right 50% of the time, then I'm happy. Um, and so as a product owner, you have to be really used to dealing with uncertainty. You have to be able to make those calls quickly with the team and just be happy that you're going to be wrong. And when you're wrong, adjust and try something new. 
the idea of prin principal pragmatism. So when you're working with a team, you need to be clear that you've got some bottom lines, but you have to be pragmatic with them as well. Maybe building those components, maybe if I look really hard at that bottom component, squinted it a bit, turn my head on to the side, I can see some business value in it, so I'll say that, yep, we can deliver that component. The other real challenge of product owners, and I think this applies to product managers as well, and just generally people in the product space, is that we're really, really, really busy. We're spending time talking to stakeholders. We're talk spending time in meetings. We're spending time with our teams. Um, being available to the team is really important when they're in a delivery cycle because, again, that's that single ringable net. You're, the, you're their go-to for answers about business stuff. So you have to prioritise availability for them. I don't have any answers to that. If anybody knows, help, please tell me. Um, that idea of delivering working software. Scrum masters are your best friend, by the way, if you're working with scrum teams or uh, team coaches, they might be called in other organisations, because they're the ones who are going to help coach the team around that breakdown aspect. Um, it can be really hard as a product owner to suggest that a technical way of doing something, you shouldn't do that, it's naughty. Um, so Scrum Masters can help facilitate that with the team. Barriers to that thin slicing or the breakdown can be architectural, compliance, delivery overheads, all sorts of things. And um, this is often where as a product owner you get involved in the areas of thinking about architecture, thinking about compliance, thinking about fixed overheads and getting rid of them because it's in your interest because you want to enable those thin slices. Um, you have to be fairly creative and fairly pragmatic. But ultimately, what you're trying to do is you, your ultimate goal is to turn shipping of your product into a business decision, not a technical decision. So if the team is always working on a thin slice of value that actually delivers something useful and it's ready in a short period of time, you should be able to ship in a short period of time. So as a product owner, it's really in your interest to try and enable this stuff. And once you've actually delivered, what comes next? So the product owner often gets involved in launch planning activities. So this is interface with sales and marketing teams. Um, because, because you've been working closely with the delivery team and you've accepted the outcome of what they've done, you've said that that's okay to ship. You often get involved with the marketing teams because you're the best place to know what exactly it is that they've shipped. You want to gather metrics about what you've then shipped. How can we make a decision about what we're going to ship next based on what we shipped just before? Um, great quote again from, from Goiko Ajik, who's the author of Impact Mapping. No, I'm not a paid sponsor of him, I just really like the stuff that he says. Uh, the value of a metric is proportional to the value of the business decision that can be made using it. It's a really important principle for a product owner, is to gather the right metrics that enable you to make decisions or help your business make decisions. Learning and retrospectives is uh, something that a product owner gets involved in as well, uh, in terms of how do we learn from what we did, not only in terms of the value of what we shipped, what did our clients get out of it, but maybe that was a really, really, really bad experience for our teams, and maybe as a product owner I need to change my approach to how I deal with them next time around. Talked a bit about determining value. So what, what is this value thing that we talk about? Um, this again is one of the, the big areas of communication with teams, is they will perceive you as a product person, you're the product guy. You're only interested in dollars and cents. You have to help the teams understand that you're trying to prioritise, it's the same circle that was there before, you're trying to prioritise all of these different things. And sometimes you end up working with the business to say, okay, how do I communicate to my teams that this feature has value? Or working with the team who says, hey, I've got this piece of technical debt that I really, really, really want to address. It's really, really important because, because why? And you work with the teams on trying to facilitate them to understand how I can compare that to something that has a dollar value attached to it. So the product owner gets involved in those kind of discussions as well. So it's not that as a product owner you're just looking for the dollars and cents. It can be really, it can really raise your standing with the team if you help them to understand how they can talk about value. Um, there's a big thing around short-term rewards versus long-term velocity. Um, usually the things that in your, in your business dollars immediately um, they're the stuff that gets the high profile, they're the things that the CEO is probably kicking you about trying to get out. But if you only deliver stuff that has short term rewards, if you don't address technical debt or compliance or um, have production engineering type stuff, your long term velocity will suffer. So as a product owner, you're also trying to balance those two things. And that's something that can be really important to be transparent about. 
because your teams will, they, they will often talk to you about, oh, we've got to address this technical debt thing. What they're really saying is that I don't want to be doing the same crappy thing sprint after sprint after sprint because it's going to piss me off and I'm going to leave and that will impact your long-term velocity. So you've got to strike that balance. Beware of icebergs, however. This is one area where product owners can, uh, particularly people who have come more from the business side, can get into difficulty because the team will say, oh yeah, but oh, we just, just want to do the small thing. Or somebody from the business will say, oh, you just, let's just put this extra small thing in there. Is it really small? Or is it just the tip of this big scary iceberg that's going to come back and bite you with a support nightmare or a production deployment nightmare or something like that? Um, this is where the product owner probably gets challenged the most because you have to try and understand all these different domains and make a decision. So you really then don't try and understand it all yourself. Get all the smart people in the room, facilitate the conversation. Um, but just have that, that what I call my bullshit filter that flashes in the back to say, hey, this is a bit dangerous. Maybe I need to get some smart people together to tell me that I'm right or wrong. Dealing with absolutes. Often people in the product dom domain get absolutes put on them. We have to do this because of security. We have to make this architectural change. We have to achieve this minimum viable product. It's stuck between a rock and a hard place. You're, you're trying to get ship, ship some value, but you've been told we have to do this. It comes back to the value. So if you can work with that stakeholder to understand the value of what it is that they're trying to deliver, yeah, maybe that security thing is actually really, really important, but for now, we can work around it with a mitigation, or we can get a waiver or something like that. Um, one of the, the, probably the most significant things I've been told in my career is security is a, is a business requirement. And that applies to a lot of these other things that will be put to you as an absolute as well. Everything's a business requirement. How, ca how can you express it in a way that allows you to compare it to other business requirements? So you can go back to that person and say, you know what, I'm actually going to have to put that down a bit because of X. Dr. No. Um, this is probably more the affliction of the product manager, but it applies to product owners as well. This is another way where it can be a problem in terms of credibility with the team if you're always seen as the no guy. You're always saying no to things because no, we can't fit that in, or no, I don't like your piece of technical debt because we've got to pump these features out. Um, it's really critical to establishing your, criti your credibility with the team and you being perceived as empowered within the organization that you don't get perceived as Dr. No. The easiest way to get around this is be transparent. Transparency about the value. Um, a tool that I've seen is, is sliders. So um, maybe we've got a compliance slider, a dollar value slider, and a, um, a quality slider. Okay, so we wanna, we wanna prioritize this thing above this other thing. Where, does it, where, where are its sliders? And then we compare it to another thing where we have those same kind of sliders. Being transparent about how you're doing that, how you're representing value, how you're doing that prioritization, helps you to establish credibility with the team, which means you're not seen as Dr. No. You're seen as Dr. No for a reason. If you, can, if you can get to that level, then you're probably doing all right. You'll still be seen as Dr. No. <laughs> so where do we fit in the organization? Um, so Matt kind of touched on this a bit at the beginning of um, where does a product owner actually fit in? This is a, a perennial question. There's been other presentations on this. Um, this is my opinion. Um, it's about the role. It's about what it is that you're trying to do. If you can do all that stuff that I was talking about before and be a product manager as well, more power to you. Similarly as a business analyst. Um, but what you may find is that particularly as your organization scales out, product manager needs to get really, really deep into the market and really understand the market, spend, be spending time with clients. They haven't got time to talk to the technical guys anymore. The business analyst might be dealing with really, really, really complex set of, sets of requirements that they're trying to help the team to deliver. They haven't got time to be the product owner either. And so that's where the, the, the distinct role, the discrete role of product owner kind of comes from the middle of those things stretching out. And then scaling. So if your organization has less than one product owner per two teams, you're going to have a bad, as the product owner, you're going to have a bad day. Um, this seems to be fairly common in the industry. It's certainly been my experience that if you're a product owner trying to be across the backlogs from more than two teams, unless you're like way, way, way smarter than me, um, it's too much. So what happens if you've got more than two teams in your organization? 
So here's some, here's some scaling models. Um, there's this concept uh, that Spotify uses called the chief product owner. Uh, if I serve my title was software product manager, here I'm known as a solution product owner. And so I sit across and aggregate the efforts of multiple teams. And each of those teams has, um, in Spotify they're known as capability product owners. They're the product owner for a particular capability. Um, if I serve, we call them team product owners. They were looking after a particular team. Here we call them component product owners. They're responsible for a particular component of the solution. So this is three different ways I've seen of scaling the role because, as I said, if you're trying to do more than one product owner per two teams, it's really, really, really hard. Um, you'll, the teams will lose out on your time, you'll lose out on your connection to the teams, and you'll probably end up building the wrong thing. So if you are in an organisation that's growing, think about how you're going to scale it. There's no one right answer, but these are some models that I've seen that have worked. Okay, tips and tricks of being a product owner. Um, what are some anti-patterns? What, what are gonna prevent you from being awesome as a product owner? Uh, the team lead or architect as a product owner. That's really, really, really bad. That's, that's mixing church and state. Um, the product owner has to be independent. They have to bring that vision to the team of, this is the business problem. They have to be representing the business. A team lead will get skewed by the technology. The answer to vision is not always a technical solution. So that's why those two roles are separated. It can be okay for a short time, and uh, Milos is sitting there going, that's me. Um, but it is something that it, it's not a sustainable situation in my own personal experience. Same reason why Scrum Master as a product owner or product owner as a Scrum Master is really, really bad as well. Because as a Scrum Master, you're trying to tell your team, question the hell out of the product owner to establish what it is that they really want. And you can't be both people. It's really, really hard. If your product owners are time poor business stakeholders, so they're just some guy who've come out of marketing who's acting as a product owner but really doesn't have time for the team. And not co-located. That's something that is quite um, controversial in this organization. It was controversial in Fiserv as well. It was one of the reasons why we built out product ownership the way we did at Fiserv was the fact that our product people were primarily not with the teams they were overseas. Um, in my experience, product owners that don't sit with the teams, they don't work. You can work to a limited extent, it's a compromise, but your teams will not be as efficient. They won't feel connected to the vision, they won't feel connected to the product if people are not co-located. And you as a product owner, you won't feel co uh, connected to them. Product owner is a cat herder. Um, I think I had this on my, my Skype status internally in this business for a while, eh? It's a cat herding week. Um, this is because the product owner can often be the only role within the delivery organisation that has a one-to-one -one mapping with the product or client requirements. You're representing those business requirements, the, the business problem. And if your delivery organisation is not structured to deliver to that business problem, then that's where the product owner ends up being the cat herder because you're trying to pull multiple people, multiple teams together to deliver something that solves one business problem. Um, yeah, basically it's a, symptom of a, it's a symptom of a misalignment between the delivery organisation and the market. We have that situation here. Our teams have traditionally been structured around components, but our market wants capabilities. And so we're looking at how we can realign things to be more focused on delivering capabilities instead of thinking about individual technical components. Um, I touched a bit on this before. If you're only perceived as being just about the features, if you're perceived as being really part of the product organisation, then that's, that's bad. Um, if, there, if one team is working off multiple backlogs, I put that in inverted commas because reality is the team can only deliver one thing at a time. Um, if the product owner is doing a bad job of balancing short versus long term velocity, if you're spending a lot of time just focusing on the short term, then you're going to lose credibility with your developers. The CEO is probably going to love you, but eventually the developers are going to hate you and you'll fall off a cliff or only focusing on technical debt and not actually ever shipping things. Um, for anybody who was at the uh, MYOB talk last night, um, I had a huge giggle when they said, so what, what they did with the MYOB system is that they took, it was built in C++ and they spent, I think it was a year rebuilding it in .NET. And then they shipped it and they wondered why the market didn't say anything exciting about it. <laughs> and that was, a, that was talked about as a, as a failure of process, but in actual fact it was a failure of product management in my opinion. So that was a case of probably where they were focusing too much on the long-term velocity. I'm sure they had a, a great idea for building in .NET, 
um, but it didn't help the, the short term at all. Um, my role is that more often than not, non-functional requirements are what impacts um, that long-term velocity. So if your team's talking about the non-functionals, those are probably more going to impact you in the long term. Um, you have to try and get that balance. Um, transparency is really, really important. As I've said a few times, um, the product owner is a facilitator. Um, this is where that, that single ringable neck decision maker thing versus facilitator comes in. There's, there's a bit of a balance even in those two roles that really you want to try and get all of your stakeholders together who are opposed to each other um, where you might need to make a decision. You really actually want to try and get them to a decision. You know, facil facilitation 101, you want to try and get the group of people to make their own decision rather than you making the decision for them. So if you're not a really good facilitator and you're a product owner, learn some facilitation skills. Um, where do you find product owners? Um, so this, I, I did a lightning talk at Agile Auckland and this was a, a question that came up. So where do these people come from? There's, there's no school that you can go to that's going to teach you product ownership. Um, so in my experience, um, business analysts is a rich source of product owners. Um, the only caveat to that is that you need business analysts who are used to converging on things, not just diverging and doing research and presenting research. They need to be people who are capable of saying, here's, the best, here's what I think are the best option. Uh, technical product managers, um, so as people stepping from a product management role into a product ownership role, um, that just gives them some credibility with the developers. They're not perceived as being just the business guy. Um, senior developers and testers, um, which I kind of call that guy or that girl in an organization. So this is prevalent in a smaller organization where the kind of person I'm looking for to be a product owner it's the guy or the girl who the CEO or the marketing person always goes to when they want to find out how something's going on or how they're going to build something. <coughs> that person's probably being a product owner. They're just, that's just not what they're calling themselves. Um, the last thing is that they have to be energetic, they have to be enthusiastic, they have to be positive people as well because what they're trying to do is they're trying to get the team motivated around delivering to that business problem. They're trying to motivate people to deliver to that vision. You've got to have energy, you've got to have enthusiasm, you've got to be positive. You cannot be low energy or negative because you won't get people to buy into your vision. Um, so if you find those, then please tell me where because we're hiring right now. <laughs> my last slide, okay. oh, geez. The typical you get a Microsoft update right there. And that was it, actually. So. That was a, a quick spin through what it means to be a product owner, some uh, things about how to how to do it well and where to get them from. So, I'd like to open to questions. I've got a question here. So, when you started talking about product owner and the difference between product owner and product manager, mm -hmm. if you could expand um, a little bit on that one, that sure. Would be very interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, so, for the benefit of the camera, the, the question is um, the difference between a product manager and a product owner. Um, as I said, it's about the role. So, a product manager can be a product owner if they're able to do all the things that I talked about there, if they're able to work closely with the team, um, have time for backlog grooming, be forming up long-term backlogs, um, be balancing off all the other stakeholders. If your product manager has got time to do that, then that's fine. They can be a product manager and, and they can be acting as a product owner. Um, if, however, particularly as the case in a, a larger organisation like we have here at Orion, we, our product managers, they're overseas, there's co-location as well, um, our product managers are usually overseas, they're in market, they're spending a lot of time developing research on what are market segments, um, how do we deliver to um, clients in two years time and five years time, how is our roadmap sustainable, and that's taking up you know, 24 hours of their day, then um, they probably can't be a product owner. So it's more about the role rather than the title. But how much of a subject matter expert do you think the, uh, the product owner as well has to be to make this call? Okay, so uh, how much of a subject matter expert does a product owner need to be? That's a really, really interesting question that I found the answer to the hard way when I came to Orion. So when I was at Fiserv, um, I grew from being a product manager, uh, sorry, pro project manager into being a product owner. Um, and so I'd already had some background with the product. I kind of already understood the product. I you know, had a chance to understand the domain. And I was kind of able to hit the ground running as a product owner. As a product owner, I'm trying to make decisions about balancing these things off. I kind of knew the background, so I was, you know, was kind of okay. When I came to Orion, I came in fresh as just sort of a senior product owner type role, knowing nothing about the product, knowing nothing about the domain. Um, 
what I can say is that's really, really hard and you have to learn fast if you're going through that. If you're looking at hiring somebody, you have to be conscious of the fact that if you're trying to bring somebody in as a product owner, you're going to have to give them a bit of slack for them to understand the domain. Um, at Fiserv, when we were bringing in people as product owners, we'd usually start them off as a business analyst first and then see how they went for a business analyst for sort of three, six, nine months and then move them into a product owner role from there because of that domain issue. <laughs> um, no, I mean, it, it's, it comes down to having a lot of conversations with people. So if you're trying to establish the value of something technical, um, it's talking to the team to say, okay, so how can, we, how can we think about this in terms of maybe time saved? How can we equate this to uh, perhaps we're going to reduce the cost of delivery or something like that? I mean, as I, say, I, I sort of said, it's not all about the dollars, but in actual fact it really is. Um, how can you relate that technical thing back to a dollar value and so you, you just, um, it's, it's about trying to ask the right questions to try and draw that out of people because they're, they're not, generally developers aren't insisting that you fix technical debt just for the hell of it, they've got a really good, a really good reason for it, they just are expressing it in their terms and so you need to be able to translate it into business terms. Um, then for more sort of arbitrary type stuff, it's the, it's the sliders, it's the metrics, how can you show that I can trade off this thing to this thing, how can I measure them? relative to each other, so it's establishing some kind of metric. Mm -hmm. So does that include um, talking to other uh, like being able to use it in the end, or um, I guess also some feedback from translators, or yep. like different channels that go into this? Yep, channels. product owners will take information however they can. Um, so yeah, so, so that's, again, it, it comes down to that having enough time to spend with the team, because sometimes mm -hmm. you spend a lot of time with your stakeholders. Um, depends on your organisation as well, if you're more of a services company you might be talking to individual clients to say hey we've got these two different options that we're trying to trade off here, which one's more valuable to you. Um, in a product organisation like Orion we've sort of got a, a synthesised kind of client, you know, it's no one particular requirement so it's about talking to our, you know, obviously in the health domain we're about talking to our clinical stakeholders to say hey you know in, an ab in abstract what would you find more valuable. Um, sometimes it's just straight out. Uh, let's try stuff <coughs> as well. Mm. Um, and that's where that speed of decision making is really important. Okay. Let's do this, see what happens. Okay, so you're not necessarily like, validating the, the requirements of one product you, do, you don't have time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So you, you, do, you, don't, you usually don't have time to validate everything. Um, that's, wh that's where that speed of decision making comes in. Um, as I said, if I'm right about half the time, I'm happy. Yeah. <laughs> or best. Yeah. There's a question down the back, I think. John. Um, how did the product owner peers? I mean, you, you showed the model where you had a scalable team where you had product owners coming up to a solution product owner, but what happens when you have multiple of those teams? I was sort of a little bit on the inside there, but um, can you sort of talk about how you relate to other teams when you've got maybe a tech debt across the business and you're sort of arguing about more value? Yep. You know, sort of how do you rationalise that across the business? Okay, so, so the, the question is, is how do we, how do we deal with, uh, how, who are the peers of the product owner when you're in one particular vertical and maybe you've got product owners in, in another vertical? Um, so Orion, obviously we're still, we're still figuring that out. Um, the model that we used at Fiserv is that there were a group of three of us who had this title software product manager, which really just meant you know, product owner of product owners. And we would collaborate very closely on stuff that cut across our three lines of business. So I was on a retail banking software as a service system, my peer was on a business banking system and my other peer was on a license system and we had some common components. And so we just usually do a bit of horse trading, we'd kind of sit around and say, hey, what, what makes sense for the business? You know, should, should I wear this in retail banking or no, I'll take this on as part of my license delivery and I'll sort that out for everybody. Um, so we tried to collaborate a lot between people who had a similar role to establish those cross product line um, dependencies. When we couldn't agree, we had a product director, hey product director, um, we need you to make a decision. We tried not to do that, we tried to do it collaboratively, using our techniques around establishing value in our own areas, how do we establish value between the three of us. Um, I kind of foresee us doing a similar thing here at Orion once we get our product ownership structure sorted out. <laughs> Other questions? Um, I'm interested to know how you work with your overseas So the question is, is um, working with overseas stakeholders, how do we, how do we find out what they want yeah. effectively? Um, you spend a lot of time on the phone. 
Uh, we know it hasn't, hasn't been so bad here, but at, at Fiserv, pretty much Tuesday to Friday, I was on the phone from about eight o'clock in the morning to about eleven o'clock, <laughs> dealing most with the east, mostly with the eastern time zone. It's communication. It's talking to people, taking any opportunity you have to get up there, get into the market, go and meet these people face to face. It's you know, fairly normal things we're dealing with overseas offices. That the, the same kind of rules apply. It's communication. It's about getting into the market. It's about getting out to stakeholders no matter how distant and having a conversation with them. And then bringing that insight back to the team as well. So don't only just bring that insight into yourself, communicate that all out to your teams. Um, we do a, bit, a wee bit of video conferencing here at Orion, probably not as much as we would like, um, you know, all, all those kind of standard tools. Um, one thing that we are struggling a bit, I talked a bit um, about transparency of the backlog, um, so it's in the building across the road there. Um, how do I ensure that, that e actually even the people in this building here go and get the chance to see that? So we're working with that. Do, should we represent it electronically as well? Um, so there's, con there's concerns like that too. Could you also try to, um, I don't know if it's a long term, but to find similar panels um, expertise that here in New Zealand and having that face-to-face -face communication, or does it not apply to corporate? Yep, so, so we, we've done that here at Orion. Um, so as I said, I'm mostly focused on the US market, market called health information exchanges, um, a lot of my products kind of going global. Um, we spent some time with the Canterbury, Canterbury District Health Board a little while ago because they've instituted something, although they're using a slightly different Orion tech stack, they're effectively satisfying the same business requirements. So we spent a bit of time down there. So it's about trying to find an analog to your product and then having a conversation with that person. Yeah, which tool do you use for your backlink in Fiserv and in Orion? Uh, Fiserv, we use T Microsoft TFS, Information Server. Uh, here we use Jira, um, although actually the backlog I showed there, that was done with Excel and Word mail merge. So um, <laughs> there was actually a comment for, from the, the NYIB thing last night is um, be careful about tools. Um, think about what you're trying to achieve with the tool and, and get the outcome. Um, Jira has its limitations, TFS has its limitations, Excel has its limitations. What serves the outcomes that you want best? Oh, right. Digital technology yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, when you're using multiple teams, you've got multiple teams set up, how do you ensure that you keep the point team consistent in your stories? You know, so you don't have one people who think that a one is one to three days and other people think a one is one a day. Um, that's, again, a very controversial topic. Um, mm -hmm. And I've been through different ways of solving that problem. Um, my current thinking on that is that you don't. You, it's relativity to your team is what matters because, um, and again, it comes down to what are, you, what are, the, what are those metrics being used for? Um, my view on um, sort of team level estimates is that they're just there so that the team can figure out next sprint how much they can take on. Um, trying to compare them across teams can be fruitless. Um, where it gets interesting though is as a business, um, if you're trying to aggregate together the activities in multiple teams, how can you estimate how much we can take on next quarter? Um, so that, that backlog I showed you there, we'd broken it up by quarters. Mm -hmm. And so at the moment we're looking at what's our velocity as a group? How can we estimate as a group? Um, what a technique we used for that at Fiserv was actually we just summed all of those estimates up. It didn't matter that one team was really low and one team was really high and you sum it all up and create an average, it's sort of kind of averaged out for the group. But the answer is it's actually not easy. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say is actually the main accountability of a product owner? Value. So um, my uh, the rule of thumb um, for software businesses is a scrum team costs about a million dollars a year, thereabouts, for six to 10 people, um, plus including overheads comes out about a million dollars a year. So every two weeks you're spending, what, 50K give or take? Um, what, what did I get for that? Hey team, what did, I, what did I get? And when you're delivering the backlog, so as a business, as a product owner, did I prioritize the thing that got me the most amount of value, be it direct dollar value or architectural value or whatever value for that money that I just invested in having that team there for two weeks? I'm curious, Dan, if you had any Dirty secret. <laughs> uh, so the question is, is uh, background of product owners. So personally, um, my actual original qualification is as an electronics engineer. Um, I've worked in embedded development for a while with some of the guys in the room here. 
um, and I transitioned into being a project manager and then a, a product owner after that. Um, it helps and it hinders. Um, the hardest thing as a product owner is to step out of the technology because I, I'm, I'm a tech guy, I'm a geek. I, I, you know, technology is, I'm fascinated by it. I want to get in there, oh, yeah, we can solve the problem by doing this now. No, no, no. Stay the hell out, talk about business problems. And so that's where having a technical background can be really hard. You have to set that aside and think about the business problem that the team is trying to solve. On the flip side, um, as I was talking about the, where do you get product owners from, mm -hmm. to get credibility with the team, knowing something about the technical domain establishes that credibility. It can be really, really hard for somebody who knows nothing about what the team is doing to be prioritizing stuff where some of the trade-offs are technical. Um, so the answer there is it's a, it's a real balance. You have to be able to step, know, know when you're talking about business, know when you're talking about the technology stuff and be able to move between those two domains. <laughs> no, it, it's, it comes, again, it comes back to that value thing. Um, how can I rank the value of this item relative to the value of this item relative to the value of this item, and how big is it? So if this one's massive value and really small, it's probably going to be near the top of the list. Small value, really big, I'm going to put it down a bit. Um, but then you're also looking at what are, what are the needs of your business? So um, that backlog I showed for Orion, we've got some stuff there that's prioritised just because of that value calculation, but we've got some stuff that's prioritised because our clients need it in the end of Q1 2016, or they need it at the end of Q4 2015. So value, what are your client demands, um, what direction is the wind blowing? Um, again, there's, there's also, as I was saying, transparency. Once, you, once you've done that prioritisation, if somebody comes and asks you, why is that item there? As a product owner, you must be able to tell them why. Because it's, you know, that's the biggest bang for the buck, because we need it for that client, uh, because we have to solve this urgent business problem. That never happens. I've never experienced that in my career, ever, ever. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> um, that is the, again, it's that, it's, that comes back to that earlier question about the technical background. So gold plating is hard as a product owner to detect um, if you are not intimately familiar with the technology and with the, with the domain that they're in. Um, I've had at least one example where a developer did that to me, that they gold plated something I had no idea. Um, the main mitigations are be really, really good friends with, your, with architects. Um, because they can, uh, it's a question about peers. Um, what, what the question that I, I thought you were asking is who else are the peers of the architect, uh, of the product owner? So the people like architects and UX and tech leads and things like that. People that you can talk to and say, hey, my bullshit filter's flickering on this one. Um, can you help me validate? Um, you might be right, you might be wrong, but it's, it's asking those questions. Um, but yeah, it, it's tough, and as I said, that's happened to me a couple of times. Collaboration. Um, so if you're in an organisation where those people are, are distinct, um, I work very closely, we, we call them product directors here, but they're product, effectively product managers. I collaborate with the, the product manager to say, um, okay, so here's the business stuff that he wants to achieve. Um, I know that we've got these kind of technical constraints and delivery constraints, and we work between the two to try and negotiate down to a roadmap that makes sense. So it's joint ownership, really. Question about um, buffering the team from a high rate of change. So, do you have any concept of s saving some story points for the unanticipated requirements that might be thrust on you by a stakeholder or a customer at the last minute? You know, because I know that often the development teams want to sort of set a path and go for it, but then the maybe the business that you're dealing with chops and changes. So, is there a technique to kind of smooth that out? So for, for, smooth, for smoothing out rapid changes, so, so it's the old, the old extra points in your back pocket type of thing. Right, <laughs> um, but I'd have to say, John, I've never experienced that. I don't know what business you're talking about. Um, it's a hypothetical. Yeah, hi completely hypothetical problem. No, it's, um, that, that one again, the answer is a wee bit, it depends. Um, you, s you have to be comfortable saying no, actually, as a product owner. If somebody's coming to you with, oh my goodness, we need to do this stuff, no. 
With a reason. With a reason, yeah, absolutely. You, you have to have that reasoning. Print, print, uh, yeah, doctor know with a reason. Um, and so that works out ways um, in that particular case. Um, on the flip side, there may be a really, really, really good business reason to do that. You're on the hook to take your team through the journey about why they need to change. So you have to take responsibility for moving your team through that change, taking them away from what they're doing and getting them onto the next thing that's got this business, this really, really super high business value that has much more value than the thing that they were really committed to doing. It's hard, you need to have your development management on board, you need to have your leaders on board. You have to be prepared as a team of people to go to the, te to go to, um, the teams and say, hey, you know what, we got our roadmap wrong, we have to change, this is why we need to change and bring them on that journey. Um, it comes down to communication, basically. Um, I've got an easy question. So coming from a developer background, mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of finding myself very new to sort of this sort of product owner slash product manager um, group, um, area. Um, what advice would you give you know, to someone like me who's has a very deep technical background and going into that sort of business journey bridge? Yep. <laughs> um, so, so the question is, is uh, what, what it, how would, how would a technical person get into the, the product ownership realm and the product management realm? Um, very good question, because that's pretty much exactly what I've done. Um, I've come from that technical background. Um, now come along to the product management Auckland meetups, actually. <laughs> um, no, I mean, t to be honest, um, it's identifying where your gaps are. So you've pr you will have a very deep technical background. You're no doubt a very, very smart technical person. Um, but I'd identified, I'd say, I'd consider myself a reasonable developer. I knew nothing about the business side. So I spent a lot of time talking with business stakeholders, talking with our product management VPs and whatnot, learning how they do things. Hey, how, how do you establish, how, how do you guys establish business value for a feature? Having those conversations, learning about the discipline. Um, there are lots and lots and lots of books out there on product management that are, are worth reading. Um, and yeah, and then coming along to groups like this and talking with product managers. Um, there was an excellent presentation at the last meetup, product management uh, Auckland meetup, which was effectively product management 101. Um, so what was the name of the? Uh, was that Nuggets or was that Johan? Uh, yeah. Yo Johan's yeah. the, the, the last uh, one. We, we didn't record that, did we? No. Oh, damn. I was going to say, hopefully it was recorded, but mm -hmm. it turns out it wasn't. But, but coming along to events like this and just talking with people who are in that domain and just soaking up their knowledge and soaking up that domain and being prepared to just kind of say, hey, I know nothing, tell me what, you know, help me. So asking questions like that. <laughs> Any questions? All right. Oh, oh, oh last one, last, we'll last question. You talked a lot about kind of prioritizing value. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you talked a lot about value and about the whole way through. You said that's it's basically what the product owner owns is value. Do you, at Fivefit or Orion, do you actually quantify value? Or is it just kind of like fluffy bunny stuff? <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there may be some rabbits involved. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so the question is, is, is how, do, how, do we, how do you quantify that value? Do you? Yeah, or do we, do we quantify that value? Um, the quantification of value depends on the eye of the person looking at it, actually. So what's valuable to a person in the business might be different to what's valuable to a technical person. Um, so it's been utter express value in the terms that make sense to that stakeholder. So um, if I'm looking at value delivered um, in a product release and I'm talking with a business stakeholder, I'm going to be looking for metrics like how much did that earn us? How much did that feature earn us in the market? Um, if I'm talking to a more technical stakeholder, I might be saying, hey, look, our, our teams are running 100% more efficient because we address this piece of technical debt. Um, so the exact metric, the exact number or whatever it is that you're talking about totally depends on the, the view of the stakeholder. There is no one single representation of value that I've come across. Maybe there is. If there is, please tell me. Right. Cool. Oh, awesome. Um, thank you. Awesome. Brilliant. There's a lot of um, a lot of really kind of nuanced insights I think that you just described in real like, plain English terms that just really seem to resonate with me. And uh, judging by the, the quality and volume of uh, questions as well, obviously raised a lot of um, interest in, in the crowd generally. Um, you guys were good. You guys were good questions. <laughs> yeah, they're very well answered as well. So what is a good presentation, great answers. Um, so how do, like you mentioned you'd be available for more chat afterwards.
Yep, um, so I'll be, I'll be around here for a little while. Um, if you'd like to connect, look me up on LinkedIn. Um, there are very few martyrs in Auckland, so if you can spell my surname, M-A-R-T-E-R, -E which half the world can't, um, you'll probably find me. <laughs> um, otherwise, you can get in touch through this meetup group as well. Cool. I def definitely welcome starting conversations with people about product ownership. Awesome. And uh, so as I mentioned, we've got more than 500 people who joined the group now, which is, which is yeah. amazing. But I think only about 17 people following it on uh, Twitter. So um, what, I'm, what, I what, followed what, yet. <laughs> what I would encourage is um, any of like, like just your little sound bites about some of the key things we learned tonight, and it might re help reinforce things for other people. Just if you're on Twitter, put them on Twitter and use the handle at PM Orphan, um, and then we'll just continue to share the wealth um, from this session a little bit more.